God is waiting on the warrior in you to have a godly marriage. God is waiting on the warrior in, in us, in me, to have a godly marriage. As you can see, Joshua 24, 15 says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So many Christian homes have gotten away from that. To have a, a godly home, you first have to have a godly marriage. You know, um, in all honesty, our first ministry is supposed to be to our, our spouse and to our children. There's, a, there's an order. And, you know, when God, God created the, the universe and He created the world and He created people, he, he created marriage between Adam and Eve. Not between two men, not between two women, between a man and a woman. And that He created that before He even created the church. And that, that um, relationship is so spiritual because... Christ refers to himself as the groom and the church as the bride. And so God cares about our marriages. He cares deeply about our marriages. Recently, I had a huge blessing. I was at Chick-fil-A in Salisbury. And um, I was there with my kids, and we were on a play date, and we were having a great time. And um, my kids were playing in the playland, and this, this precious couple was sitting in front of me. And um, I could tell they had been married a long, long time. And they had their great-grandson with them. And uh, the great-grandfather took his, his great-grandson to the bathroom. And so here's this precious woman sitting in front of me, the booth in front of me. And I, I said to her, I said, excuse me, ma'am, but may I ask you a question? Now, I remember this day I was wearing one of my biker shirts. My hair was down. And... Um, so it was, just a, it was a really funny moment. And uh, the lady said, yes. And I said, ma'am, do you mind me asking you, how long have you been married? And she said that her and her husband have been married 60 years. And I said, wow. I said, your preacher needs to let you and your husband get up this Sunday and preach. And she started laughing. Well, by then, the people that were sitting to the side of us, all these tables, had gotten quiet and was listening in on our conversation. And I said, ma'am, do you mind me asking you if, if you did give somebody advice on marriage, what would you say are the three most important things that, that marriages should do? Now, you have to understand, this, this, this lady had been married 60 years. I really wanted to hear what she had to say. And she said that um, she would tell you, first of all, to laugh and have fun together. Second of all, she would tell you um, to put the Lord as the, as the, the centerpiece of your, of your relationship. And third, she would tell you to, to let go of things, to don't let the little things get to you and bother you. And I thought, you know, what great advice. Well, about that time, her husband comes walking up, and he sees me talking to his lady. And it was hilarious because he didn't care who I was. He looked at me, and he said, what are y'all talking about? And I said, sir, I had to ask your wife how long y'all been married and what's the secret. And he said, what'd she say to you? And I told him exactly what his wife had told me. And he agreed. Precious couple. We do need to laugh more in marriage. We do need to lighten up and have fun more in marriage. You know, so many times when a couple meets and they, they're friends and become best friends and dating and courting and engagement, there's excitement. And then in marriage, you, that, that fun starts to fizzle out. And so it's so important that you laugh and play together and have some hobbies together and just enjoy that, the, the season of dating and uh, spending time doing things that just allows you to have that, that laughter in your relationship. But as, as most of you may know, a lot of Christian marriages end in divorce. Uh, the research shows that it's 50% or higher um, in the church, divorce rate. And you know, I, I have a lot of empathy for people who have struggle in their marriage. At the counseling center, a, a lot of couples come to see me throughout the year. And one of the reasons I have empathy is because I've been through a failed marriage before. I know what it's like to lose marriage. And it is, it's a death. And it, it, it rips your heart out. And uh, 
you know, I, I was I was married to someone who loved the Lord, but um, but I was the problem. My heart wasn't right with the Lord, and um, and I had a lot of baggage that I had to work through. And um, even though that there has been forgiveness between me and this person uh, who loves the Lord, um, that marriage didn't make it. And um, you know, I tried for two years to save that marriage, and it didn't make it. And God taught me a lot of life lessons during that time. And that's when God discipled me, was during those two years. And um, showed me just, just how far I w was away from Him, and how um, selfish I was, and um, just that there was no intimacy between me and Him. He, he was my Savior. I had my ticket into heaven, but I didn't have intimacy in a relationship with my Lord. So the couples that come into the counseling center, you know, I, I can, you know, my wife and I, we, we, we do enjoy helping people um, when we get to, to minister to someone. But, you know, when, when my wife and I, you know, God redeemed my past. He has uh, brought me a, a wife who, is, um, who loves the Lord. And, um, you know, we have, he has blessed me. I have four wonderful children. And so God has redeemed my past from years and years ago. But um, I have empathy for anybody who has either been divorced or going through a divorce or separation. And so I try to give them everything I can to help them. And um, one of the things that I share with them is, is what God teaches us about the laws of marriage. And I know that sounds strange, but um, if you asked uh, 100 Christians, did you know that there were laws in place for marriage? Um, they wouldn't really know what you're talking about. But if you go back to Genesis 2, 24 and 25, um, God says in his holy word, he says to Adam, Adam, a man will leave his father and mother. He'll cleave to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And then in verse 25, it says, and what God, and it says in verse 25 that Adam and Eve were naked together and they were not ashamed. Okay, well, where, where was the law in that? Well, if you, if you fast forward thousands, thousands of years to Jesus, uh, and you read in the book of Matthew, chapter 19, you read where the religious leaders come and they question Jesus about marriage. And can, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? And Jesus says to them, don't you know the law? Don't you know the scriptures? For God says, a man will leave his father and mother, he'll cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, and what God has brought together, let no man separate. Now, what's kind of funny you know, yes, he quotes what God said to Adam. So there's your proof that there is the law of marriage in there. But what's funny is when God told Adam that, back in Genesis 2.24, Adam didn't raise his hand and say, God, what is a father and mother? <laughs> because Adam didn't have a father and mother. And so, but what God was saying to Adam is, Adam, you must put Eve first. Now, not before God, but as in people, places, things, relationships, um, your spouse must be first. The second thing that God was telling Adam, you know, it says that he, he tells Adam, he says, and a, man, and a man will cleave to his wife. Well, the word cleave in Hebrew means pursue. So he was telling Adam, you know, a man must pursue his wife. And a wife must pursue her husband. And, and often couples do that before marriage. Um, you know, they do the little things to pursue each other's hearts, to pursue each other's love, to pursue each other's affection and encouragement and but they, they start to lose that. And so we've got to pursue each other. The, the third law of marriage you see is that law of oneness. Because God said to Adam and the two will become one. And that's not just sexually. It's oneness in making decisions. It's oneness in communication. And so every couple that I, that I work with at the counseling center, um, it's, it's amazing. Because it, every couple come, coming in, it goes back to one of those things. Either they're not putting each other first, or they're not pursuing each other, or there's not oneness in their communication. Um, there's not that sexual purity. Um, and and God, God loves to restore marriages. He absolutely loves it. Because you stop and think about it again. The, the, the New Testament tells us Jesus refers to himself as the groom, and the church as the bride. And, and God is, is reconciling people back to him and he wants us as the church to reconcile people back to him but God is also cleaning up the bride he's getting the bride ready for the groom 
And that's part of what, what marriage is all about too, is, is us getting, getting uh, closer with the Lord and closer with each other so that we truly can have a godly marriage and be godly warriors as spouses. When it, for me, again, in my past marriage, uh, I take 100% of the blame for that failed marriage. 100% my fault. No, no excuses. All my fault, 100%. But I have to learn from it. And, and, and for years, I wouldn't counsel uh, people that were dealing with marriage issues. I wouldn't. Even after God had discipled me and showed me. And, and I'll tell you something. This is, this is absolutely amazing. Um, I had a pastor who's a dear friend of mine who has me come and speak at his church and stuff at different times on addictions and spiritual warfare, things that, that he knows that I've battled and went through and, and teach. And, and I remember he, he wanted me to come to a marriage conference. And I, and I told him, I said, brother, I don't, feel, I don't feel qualified to do that because of my past. And, um, but he said the Lord told him that I was supposed to do it. And um, I cried and I prayed and, and the Lord gave me peace to do it. And I remember in that three-day conference, watching all those couples draw closer to the Lord. And I remember crying, thanking God for the things that He's shown me and He's taught me, but that I was, I was broken because I had lost my helpmate because of all my fault. But I desperately needed a helpmate in ministry. I desperately needed a helpmate in this life. And I wanted to do it right this time. I wanted, I wanted to let God redeem me. And, uh, and it was literally the weekend of that marriage conference that God introduced me to who would become my future bride. And she is a disciple, and she, she disciples me in everything. And um, she teaches me far more than, than I could ever even come close to telling you about. And it's beautiful watching how God redeemed her life, how God has redeemed mine and brought us together. And, but, but you have to understand, every week of marriage... It's not easy. There's constant battles of will we put each other first? Will we pursue each other? Will we have oneness? You know, and, and for us as men, for the men, we struggle with that oneness because we make quick decisions and we, we're always on the go and we're, we're from one battle to the next battle. And, but Satan also sets us up so that we won't have that oneness with our spouse. And so we must be careful. We must be very careful to protect that oneness. And, and that law of marriage, I really struggle with that if I don't stay in prayer because as a counselor and overseeing other ministries, I make such quick decisions and, 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 and for, for other people and for myself. And so I have to really stay in prayer with that. You know, as a husband, I can't do it without the Lord's help. You know, I just can't. You know, any man who thinks that they can just be a godly man just because they are, they're a great guy, they're in for a rude awakening. You must be in the Word. You know, men, you must be in the Word. To be a godly husband, to be a godly daddy, you must be in the Word. You must be in prayer. And you can't live off of other people's food. In other words, I can't just because I heard a, a, I had a, read a good devotional for, for five minutes today think that, oh, okay, I'm good. No, there, you, you've got to, if, you, if as a husband you will continually work on your intimacy with the Lord, you will be blown away of how he, God will bless your intimacy with your spouse and children. As wives, if you will continually work on your intimacy with the Lord, you'll be blown away how God blesses you in your intimacy with your husband and with your children. I want to read to you from 1 Peter 3, 1-7. through 7. It says, in the same way, you, of, you wives must accept the authority of your husband. Then even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly life will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent life. Don't be concerned about the outer beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, and beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is so precious to God. You know, I don't, ladies, I, I don't know if, if you know that passage, but the thought of, of God seeing you as precious, calling you precious, seeing you as precious, let that bless you. But notice that he sees that the, the, the woman, the wife that is precious, 
they have a, they're, they're, there's a reverency to them about their faith, a purity to them about their faith, their gentle and quiet spirit. Now, ladies, I ain't trying to start no trouble. But a lot of women don't have a gentle and quiet spirit. Even a lot of women who have a passion and a boldness for their faith, they have lost that gentle and quiet spirit in their household. Having a boldness to your faith is great. Don't ever lose that. But when it comes to your home, you can still have a boldness in your faith, but be careful just to not lose that gentle and quiet spirit when it comes to your marriage. And the reason I say that is the key to a man's heart is respect. And that, that's not me making it up. It's from God's Word. Ephesians 5.33. It says, To the husband, love your wife. To the wife, respect your husband. Well, as a man, I can tell you I've counseled many, many men. You know, from the conferences, the, the churches, the, the different things. There, there's into the thousands of men through the years. And they're in agreement. That, that gentle and quiet spirit, it's attractive. It's, it models the fruit of the spirit. It's like a, it's like a perfume they're drawn to. And, um, and so ladies, I encourage you, be careful there. But ladies, I have to tell you something. One of the scariest verses in the Bible is verse 7. To me, verse 7 rocks my world. Because it says, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wife. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Now here it goes. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. Wow. You're telling me the way I treat my wife will determine, will affect my prayer life. Yes, that is what the Word of God is saying. And when I look back at my past in a failed marriage, which was 100% my fault, I think of all the times I prayed, and it wasn't God's fault that my prayers were, weren't being answered. My lifestyle was hindering my prayers. In my marriage today, and I need everybody to really think about this, all the, the men how you, if you're praying and you're frustrated with God, how are you treating your wife? What is your relationship like with your wife? Do you honor her? Do you, do you seek to understand her? Do you treat her as an equal partner? Because you read those three things in that verse. It tells you to honor her. Now, you really need to ask her. You need to ask her, do I honor you? And, if she, and, and even tell, ask her, how can you honor her more? You know? For, for, for us as men to feel honored, you respect us, we feel honored. But for women, they look at honor a little differently. So you have to ask her. The second thing is, that, and, and this is where, wow, guys, please don't think that I, <laughs> I have a lot to learn. But it, it says to treat them with understanding. You know, so many wives cry out saying, my husband doesn't understand me. He doesn't even, but... They also cry out, he doesn't seek to understand me. Now, I realize it's been a joke for thousands of years that a man will never understand a woman. And you know what? There's a lot of truth to that joke. But that doesn't give us an excuse to not seek to understand her. There's things about us as men that women will never understand about us. But they need to seek to understand it. And we need to be equal partners. If we've become truly one, and in marriage you become one, so if there's no equal partners, there's really not oneness. There's really not oneness. I mean, that, that makes, practically, that makes so much sense. But people battle that all the time. You know, thinking that the man should be the boss, the man should be in charge. It's all about what the man wants. No, that's not biblical. That's not what it says at all. And, and people will misquote Ephesians 5 and say, well, it says the woman's supposed to submit to the man. Well, if they'll read the verses ahead, it actually tells the husband and wife to submit to one another. But that verse gets left out all the time. Having a godly marriage, though, is what really is the greatest ministry to your children. You can take them to church. That's fine. Please do. But they're going to watch the marriage. They're going to watch it. And that's going to tell them so much. I, uh, I know that there's a, there's a song that's called Lead Me. And uh, 
that song makes me cry because it, it talks about marriage and it talks about family and it talks about life. And, and I love that song. Again, it's called Lead Me. And I love it because it's a great accountability song for me. And um, the, our families, our wife, our children, they need us to lead us. They need us to lead them. And, uh, but oh, how we will fail them leading them if we don't have the spiritual intimacy we need with the Lord. God is waiting on the warrior in us to have godly marriages. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for your love. I thank you so much for redemption, for redeeming the marriages that have failed in the past, for reconciling the marriages that are struggling now, for preparing the couples that are preparing for marriage. Oh, Father, I, I pray that, that your will will be done in the bride, in the bride of Christ. Father, I know you're doing a mighty work in the bride of Christ. And Father, I just I speak blessings over any man or husband or wife that would, would take these words to heart and, and, and apply them to their marriage. Oh, I speak this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.